Fantasy football drafters are making three major mistakes right now. One in the early rounds, one in the middle rounds, one in the later rounds. And this is going to be drafting the wrong running back. What we're going to do is we're going to look at guys going back to back in fantasy football drafts. The example that we're going to go here with round one is we have to dive into Bijan Robinson and Brees Hall because in every single one of these drafts, I'm seeing Bijan Robinson go at pick seven. I'm seeing Brees Hall go at pick eight. And trust me, I want to be in on Bijan. I mean, hook him horns. I interviewed him at the draft. I've ran into him in the gym in Austin. This is someone I'm rooting for, right? But ultimately, we look at this Brees Hall profile. This is a running back that over the past two years averaged 15 points per game. And the catalyst he has going into 2024, you're going to be pouring gasoline to a burning fire. Now, there are three major catalysts we are going to be looking at for Brees Hall and why this can potentially be the running back one overall in 2024. The first one is his overall health. Now, obviously, Brees did not look like he was limited too much by the torn ACL last season. But historically speaking, what we've seen is we've seen running backs are most effective re rehabbing off the torn ACL two years after the tear. So if Brees tears that ACL in 2024, typically what we've seen is, yes, you can come back in 2023, but you're going to be hitting your stride in 2024. So naturally, having Brees Hall be able to go through an entire training camp, be able to really prepare for the season and not have to spend time rehabbing, that is already a positive catalyst minus anything else happening with this situation for Brees Hall going into 2024. The next big positive catalyst that you're going to have is you're going to be going from the worst quarterback play in the entire NFL to hopefully above average QB play. Now, I'm going to be very clear here. After week one last season, if y'all remember, Brees Hall absolutely torched the Buffalo Bills on prime time. Everybody saw it. Everybody could not have been more pumped. And 100%, I understand why. But after that game, what did we say? We said, abandon ship. Sell Brees Hall, go get yourself a different elite RB1. Go uh, uh, go sell Garrett Wilson. Do anything you can to avoid Zach Wilson because Zach Wilson is a certified bum in this offense and this team is going to be a dumpster fire because of Zach Wilson. I um, stand by that. Zach Wilson, yet again last year, was at the very bottom in terms of adjusted yards per pass attempt. Arguably the worst quarterback play in the NFL. And despite that, Brees Hall still came close to 15 points per game. But now you're going to be going to Aaron Rodgers. Am I going to sit here and say Aaron Rodgers is a top five quarterback in the NFL? He has some elite level. No, of course, I have no idea if Aaron Rodgers is going to be what he was in the past. This is a 40-year-old quarterback coming off a of torn Achilles. Of course, you have some reasons to go out there and, I, I don't know, be a little concerned. But one thing that does give me... I don't know, some confidence with Rodgers and his play this next year. As y'all know, I am always one to say Vegas knows more than I do. Vegas knows more than you do. Vegas sports books, they're kind of the ones we need to be listening to. If you look at the line they have for the Jets right now, the Jets are like minus 170 to go over nine and a half wins. So the Jets are projected out to be a much better team this year than they were a year ago. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that you're not going to have horrendous quarterback play this year. Hopefully it's above average. So you have the catalyst for the health. You have the catalyst for the quarterback play. And also, if you were looking at the PFF run grade blocking unit for Brees Hall over the past two years, they ranked at the bottom of the NFL. This was a bottom 10 offensive line in run blocking. And if you look at the investments that the Jets have made all offseason, including going out there and spending the 11th overall pick on an offensive lineman this season, you are getting a positive catalyst and that the offensive line should be better for Brees Hall as well. So you are looking at a running back that despite running behind one of the worst offensive lines in the NFL, despite having the worst starting quarterback in the NFL, despite being a year removed from a torn uh, ACL, went out there and he averaged four and a half receptions per game. It was still an RB1 in fantasy. Now that you have those three positive catalysts fueling him into 2024, this is someone that I think we've already seen an incredibly high floor from based off what we had last year and about the worst situation imaginable, to where now we don't really know what the ceiling is. I think the ceiling is an RB1. And now if you're looking at Bijan Robinson, Bijan can potentially be an RB1 overall as well. We'll get to that in a second. I do need to bring up the positive red flags that you have with Brees. The red flags that I'd be looking at would be Braylon Allen, Isaiah Davis, and Izzy. Not because I think that any one of those running backs are as talented as Brees Hall, not because I think any of them are going to come in and immediately turn this into a committee, but because 
looking at what the coaching staff is essentially telling us here, where in a two year span, they decide to go out and invest into three separate running backs. That does give me a little bit of concern that maybe Brees isn't ever going to see the 90% opportunity share that you saw from a Christian McCaffrey, that you saw from a Kyron Williams last year. And instead, he's going to look more like a typical RB1 at about a 75% opportunity share, which you can still be the RB1 overall in fantasy with that. Now, going over to Bijan. Bijan, opposite situation happening in Atlanta where you actually are losing out on Cordell Patterson. So the running back room's thinning out. And you have some positive catalysts happening for Bijan Robinson as well, where we see the quarterback upgrade from Zach Wilson, Aaron Rodgers in New York. Here, you have the positive quarterback upgrade going from Desmond Ritter to Kirk Cousins. So obviously, you have that positive catalyst. This should be a much better offense overall as well. And what most people are projecting out to be the best thing for Bijan Robinson is people are projecting out, okay, no Arthur Smith, means that Bijan is going to be finally utilized correctly and Bijan Robinson is going to be a running back that comes out here and is treated as a true workhorse. And I will say, I agree with both of those sentiments. I think the change with the coaching staff and the change at quarterback will both be positive catalysts for Bijan Robinson. And of course, we should be drafting him much higher this year than where his fantasy football finish was last year, where last year he was only at about 12.8 fantasy points per contest. Now, the thing is, while we've seen Bijan kind of split with Tyler Algier, his floor that he has displayed has been lower than Brees Hall's floor. And I would make the argument that the situation for Brees Hall was just as bad, if not worse, than it was for Bijan Robinson. And I would make the argument that if we're looking at both situations getting better going into this next season, if we also consider the fact that now you're getting the additional year off the torn ACL for Brees, I would make the argument that his situation is improving even more than Bijan Robinson's is. Bijan already had a decent offensive line last year. They're at 68.2 with their run blocking grade. He was already at about 12.6 carries per game, which is right in line with what we saw from Brees Hall. But since Brees Hall was more effective as a receiving back, he went out there and he actually performed better last season in a worse situation in my mind. So, so I don't know. I, I'm really rooting for Bijan, but I think we've seen a higher floor from Brees. And I think you can make an argument that both have the ceiling to be the RB1 overall in fantasy. So I'm going to go with the guy that we've seen the higher floor from here in round one which is a little bit scary, but it is what it is. And of course, I mean, we are going to be drafting these guys on underdog fantasy. You're pretty much locked and loaded to get them at pick seven and eight. I'm just going to be trying to flip and go with Brees at seven instead of Bijan. But if you want to draft with us, we're drafting every single night, essentially on the live stream. I'm in Europe right now, so maybe not tonight. But nonetheless, if you want to hop into draft with us, you can find that link in the description in the comment section. Code Flock will get you hooked up with a 50% deposit bonus up to $250 on a new account. Plus, Code Flock will get you set up with our 2024 Fantasy Football Rankings and 2024 Fantasy Football Draft Guide. Plus, Code Flock, ladies and gentlemen, will get you set up with a special pick em, something like Luka Doncic, more than less than half a total point, dependent on the day that you sign up with Code Flock. Available in damn near every state, and it's best ball, so no time commitment at all during the year. It's how I'm able to draft hundreds of teams every offseason. It's how I won 150000 on Underdog two years ago. But let's move over to the rival Lions and Vikings, and let's look at their starting running backs. Right now, David Montgomery's RB18 in underdog drafts. Aaron Jones is RB19. And I did not expect to be in on Aaron Jones this year, but he's fallen in these drafts. So now all of a sudden, I think we can draft Aaron Jones. But first, let's dive into David Montgomery and look at where his points came from this past year. And yeah, David Montgomery, very good. I mean, David Montgomery was a better option in fantasy football than B. John Robinson this past season, where he goes out there, he has 14.2 points per game. I mean, 15 and a half carries per game, 72 and a half rushing yards per game. I mean, a really high PFF grade, almost at 80. Obviously, this is an elite Detroit Lions offensive line. Their PFF run blocking grade was at 77.6, which is at the very top of the NFL. So across the board, Montgomery was phenomenal last season, right? Specifically as a rusher and specifically in the red zone. Because if we're going to look at where the high value opportunities came for David Montgomery, 
This is a running back that's had nothing as a receiver, but everything with his touchdown volume. And this is very important in terms of understanding where fantasy points are going to come from at the running back position in particular. What you see at running back is fantasy points come from two areas. One, they come from targets. They come from the receiving game because typically you're going to be averaging a significantly higher yards per target than you are going to be yards per carry. And at the same time, depending on if you're in a PPR or a half PPR league, if you catch the ball for 10 yards, it's immediately two points. So getting the target share in your backfield, where if you're going to get four receptions a game, all of a sudden it gives you a massive, massive floor. If you're averaging four receptions for 30 receiving yards per game. And then also those high value touches are going to be inside the 10 yard line as a rusher, because one of those carries can equal six points relatively easily. All you got to do is cross the goal line. But where fantasy points do not come from are going to be the carries between the 20 yard lines. We've seen this in every single instance over the past, I want to say five years now, since the 2017 guys kind of came in and wrote the blueprint. You're looking at Aaron Jones writing this blueprint in Green Bay. I mean, Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams were backfield mates for years and years and years. They had almost the same amount of carries, but Jamal Williams, even though he was an absurdly talented running back, didn't do anything because his carries were inside the 20 yard lines. And that just does not equal fantasy points. Those are empty calories. And if you go over and see what Alvin Kamara has done with all his backfield mates in New Orleans, I mean, the best guy that you were looking at was maybe like Mark Ingram way back in the day. But then you have so many other examples, guys like Latavius Murray that just simply are good NFL players, but don't necessarily come out and have the elite league winning upside in fantasy because they're running alongside someone that's going to soak up the high value opportunities. So my concern that we would have with David Montgomery here is this is a running back that we know for a fact will not have the high value opportunities as a receiver. Even though Jameer Gibbs was a rookie last year and didn't come on until the second half of the season, Jameer Gibbs still limited David Montgomery to only a total of 16 receptions this past season. But David Montgomery was still phenomenal, specifically with his rushing touchdowns. And yeah, if you're going to go through and if you're going to look at this, David Montgomery, before his injury, went out and he had a total of six touchdowns through the first five games. Yeah, through the first five games of the season. Then once Montgomery comes back, you see the usage flip a bit, where all of a sudden you actually see Jameer Gibbs beginning to get involved at the goal line. And David Montgomery, back from his injury from November 12th to January 7th, Despite the Detroit Lions offense being one of the best offensive lines in the NFL, despite them being one of the best offenses in the NFL, you were seeing a total of seven touchdowns through nine games in this split, which isn't bad at all, right? But it's just that trend of Jameer Gibbs getting nothing in the goal line at the goal line in the beginning half of the season versus in the second half of the year, they are mixing in Jameer Gibbs. So the concern with Montgomery is not that Jameer Gibbs is going to come out here and take everything, not at all. But Gibbs is going to take everything as a receiver. And Gibbs does look to take a high percentage of those touchdowns at the goal line, which he didn't do at the beginning of the season where Montgomery had six touchdowns through the first five weeks. Now, going over and looking at what we have with Aaron Jones, Aaron Jones been a running back that has gotten worse every single season over the past three years. From 15 and a half fantasy points per game, down to 12.9 fantasy points per game, down to 10.9 fantasy points per game. It has been um, a no bueno situation. If you're looking at his receiving yards per game, it's gone down every year. Now, what's going to be very interesting is we can sit here and say, okay, well, this was a great offense in Green Bay this last year. I mean, Aaron Jones has no excuse to go out there and really just flame out in the way that he did. But what catches my eye is, one, you had the drop-off in the run-blocking efficiency for this Green Bay Packers offensive line. Over the past two years, they've been hovering at about 55, 56 in terms of their run blocking grade with PFF near the bottom of the league, possibly hitting a drop in Aaron Jones's overall efficiency and Aaron Jones in Green Bay over the past three seasons has been slowly losing work as a receiving back. He goes from 26 receiving yards per game down to 23, down to 21. But what has remained very elevated for Aaron Jones is is his overall PFF grade, where he is still hovering last season at about an 81 PFF grade, indicating that, I mean, it looks like film guys still like what they see on paper. And going down to this depth chart 
in Minnesota. Aaron Jones is a running back that is competing with Ty Chandler, and that is it. There is no competition. So what I think we may see from Aaron Jones is you may see him just continue to have the receiving role, and you may see Aaron Jones get red zone usage. And if he is getting the high value opportunity, even in a much worse offense than what you have in Detroit, it can end up leading to a higher ceiling for Aaron Jones. Now, if you're playing in a non-PPR format where the receiving usage doesn't matter nearly as much, go ahead and take David Montgomery over Jones. No problems with that. But specifically, if you're in a half PPR or a full PPR format, I do think you should be going with Jones, who has shown historically to have more receiving upside overall. Obviously, I will admit, though, that the situation is going to be much worse in his offense. Now let's go over to some later guys. Not super late, but we have Najee Harris, Jonathan Brooks, both going in round eight at this point. And Najee Harris is a running back that last year we went ahead and we looked at his comps that you had through the first two weeks of the season. And guys that you were looking at were players like James Robinson, Clyde Edwards-Alaire, really like the only comps that you were able to historically see through the first two years of Najee Harris's career, where he was very inefficient, where he was declining after his rookie season, were those running backs that ended up flaming out to be absolutely nothing. Going into year three, you see the continued trend where Najee Harris continues to get worse. He goes from 15.5 fantasy points per game down to 11.9, down to 10.6. What's most concerning for Najee Harris is you have a massive, and I repeat, massive drop-off as a receiver. You go from 4.4 receptions to 2.4 receptions to 1.7. So the receiving involvement drops off a cliff. Jalen Warren is significantly more efficient. Now, I will say, I don't hate Najee Harris's price overall. You will see me draft some Najee Harris in round eight, but... I'm not going to be doing so when Jonathan Brooks is available. Because if we're going to go over and look at Najee Harris, if we're trying to draft a league-winning running back in round eight, I don't know if he has the ceiling anymore based off what we've seen over the past few seasons. Whereas Jonathan Brooks is a running back that, yes, is going into a very bad offense. We can say the Pittsburgh Steelers as well as the Carolina Panthers are very bad offenses this next season. I think you should have more hope for Pittsburgh than you do Carolina, but it's not like Pittsburgh is some top tier team, right? Carolina, straight buns. Nobody's going to deny it. And maybe I'm a little bit biased for our Texas guys here, but hell, I mean, I just talked down on Bijan in comparison to Brees Hall early on. So I don't want to say that too much, but I mean, going over and looking at what you had from the limited sample that you had with Jonathan Brooks. Jonathan Brooks is a running back that goes out in this year at Texas. Keep in mind, we didn't get to see him as a freshman. We didn't get to see him as a sophomore. He had to run alongside uh, B. John Robinson. He had to run alongside Roshan Johnson. He had absolutely no shot, right? I mean, you, you can't fault him for that. But once he gets his opportunity, 6.1 yards per carry, what's most impressive is the receiving involvement that you had from Jonathan Brooks. You had 25 receptions for 286 receiving yards through a total of 10 games played. Now, the concern that you're going to have for Brooks and what is gross and what I'm going to be very honest about and why, I mean, you are obviously getting a discount on him in drafts based off where a typical rookie with this profile would go. Is Jonathan Brooks is coming off a torn ACL. Not only is he coming off a torn ACL, the timing of it is not great. If you are coming off a significant season ending injury like that, typically we want it to be in um, a September. We want it to be in October. But this happened in November for Jonathan Brooks. So there is a very real possibility that this is a running back that ends up missing the, I don't know, start of the season. He ends up missing training camp and he ends up not really contributing at all to your team for the first month or the first two months of the season. And that should lower your expected win rate to get to the actual fantasy football playoffs, to get to the playoff tournament if you are an underdog. But if we assume that Jonathan Brooks can be close to 100% by the time you get to weeks 15, 16, 17, specifically for the fantasy football playoff tournament, specifically for your fantasy football playoffs, it's a running back that has a significantly higher ceiling than what you're going to see with Najee Harris for when the money actually matters. I'm sure you hear people talking all the time. Oh, the only thing that matters is the fantasy football playoff tournament. The only thing that matters is week 16 and 17. 
Well, this is someone that has the ceiling for that stretch with his receiving ability, with this athleticism, with the thin depth chart you have. And I'm going to be willing to take him over old veteran running backs that may not have the access to the same ceiling in the second half of the year, even if they'll be a little bit better at the beginning of the year, like Najee Harris. But I think that should be it for this video. Of course, if you enjoyed it, please go down there, drop a like, subscribe if you play fantasy football. And if you want to go and draft any of these guys, um, you can do so on Underdog Fantasy. That's where I'm going to be drafting all offseason. And yeah, they're best ball drafts at all. So no time commitment during the year. That's how I draft hundreds of teams every offseason. That's how I won 150000 on Underdog two years ago. And if you use code FLOCK, you're going to get a 50% deposit bonus up to $250. Plus, with code FLOCK, you'll get our 2024 rankings and draft guide. Plus, with code FLOCK, you're going to get set up with a special pick em, something like Luka Doncic, more than less than half a total point, depending on the day that you sign up. But thank you again, ladies and gentlemen. I really do appreciate you. I really hope you have a great day and hope we get to see you out with the video um, sometime later this week.